Hi there, welcome to a slightly different video from me than the usual ones. I recently completed some hardware hacks on some of my retro systems so that I can plug them into my video capture card and capture footage for future videos that I might want to put together. So there's three things I modified. There was an Atari 2600, a Sega Master System 2 and my BBC Micro. And while I was doing them I took some photos and a little bit of video so I thought I'd share that with you in case you're interested in this kind of thing. So let's take a look at them now. First up then I've got an Atari 2600 Composite AV mod. The purpose of this was to get rid of the nasty RF connection and fit some composite RCA plugs so that I can plug this into my video capture device. So after looking at the options for this online I decided to buy a composite video mod board from thefuturewas8bit.com. I'll put a link to the site in the video comments. So this is a tiny little PCB that costs £4.75 and you fit it inside the console replacing the RF modulator. So as you'll see in the pictures the first job was to open up the Atari 2600 and I was doing this on Atari 2600 Junior simply because it's easier to get into and I think it's easier to do the mod as well. You do get some instructions with the board so it shows you what to connect where on the board that's supplied and also where to connect it inside the console of course. So I opened up the Atari 2600 Junior. First thing I've got to do is remove the RF shield. I'm not sure if I need to put that back on after I've completed this modification because I wouldn't have RF anymore, but I did do anyway. So I removed the metal RF shield from the top and bottom of the PCB and removed it. As you can see, the bottom half of that RF shield was quite happy about it. And the first job here is then to remove the RF modulator. It has to be said, once you take this out, the chances of actually getting it to work again and putting it all back together are pretty much zero. So if you get this wrong, you're probably going to destroy your console. So once you've removed the RF modulator, there's also a number of components you have to remove. Again, once these come out, the chances of putting them back in are fairly slim. So I grabbed my soldering iron and desoldered these components from the board. As you can see, there's a couple of resistors, a capacitor and some red thing that I can't actually remember what it is. It was noted on the instructions which things to remove, so it was fairly straightforward. So I've removed the necessary components. The next thing to do was mount the composite AV mod board. And the obvious place to do that was where the RF modulator was. It's just stuck on with a kind of sticky pad. Once it was mounted I added some solder to all the connectors and then started to connect all the wires. Again the provided instructions tell you where to put these but you can also see them on the pictures here. Effectively you're connecting the wires on the mod board to the various points on the PCB where you removed those components earlier. The next part of this modification is obviously to wire in the RCA connectors. So I bought the typical white, red and yellow connectors as you can see here from eBay, hacked off one end and those were then wired into the mod board. The 2600 only has mono output so what you do for the two audio connectors is wire them both to the same pads on the mod board. Once that was done I gave it a quick test to make sure it was working and then started to put the whole thing back together. As I mentioned I did refit the metal RF shields even though I'm not sure whether they're actually needed anymore. Then following the example on the Futures 8-bit website I secured the AV cable and fed it out through the hole where the RF connector was originally situated. I then screwed the case back together, plugged it in and tested it all out and thankfully it still worked. Next up was a similar modification on the Sega Master System 2, replacing the fuzzy RF connection with a passive RGB modification. The aim of this one was to allow me to use a Mega Drive 2 SCART cable plugging into the new connector on the back of the console. For this modification I bought a passive RGB video mod kit from Consoles Unleashed which cost £10 and once again I'll put a link to that in the video comments. As with the Atari 2600 the first job is to open the console up, remove the metal interference shield and get the PCB out. It's a little trickier with this one because there's two screws next to the cartridge slot that don't initially appear like they need to be removed but you can't get the motherboard out without removing them. Once I got the motherboard out once again the first job was to remove the RF module. This took a lot more effort on the Master System 2 because it soldered in underneath and that meant I had to use some desoldering braid to remove the 30 year old solder from the bottom of the board. Once the RF module's out though, there's no other components to remove on this modification. However, the mod kit that's provided requires some soldering itself as you have to put several pieces together. Firstly, you have to fit two small circuit boards together and solder in several posts. This allows you to mount the modification exactly where it needs to be inside the Master Systems case. Once the mounting plates are in place, you must then solder in the AV connection as shown here. Not a particularly tricky job, but it does take quite a bit of solder to keep it in place. You can then solder the mounting plate in place and then move to connecting the RGB mod board on top of the AV socket. This is where you'll take all the wires from to connect to the various points on the Master Systems motherboard. You wire it up based on the instructions found on the website with some wires requiring connecting directly to pads on the PCB while others need to be soldered directly to the legs of chips on the board. Once I completed soldering all the wires in I was able to test the modification and here's where a small problem presented itself because my Mega Drive SCART cable has got a funny L shaped connector and when I plug that into the master system it clashes with the power connector so that wasn't going to work as a long term solution although I was able to connect them together for the purposes of testing. It did mean that I had to buy another SCART cable off eBay for £5 which doesn't have this kind of L shaped connector. 
Nevertheless, I was able to test it sufficiently to confirm that the mod had worked, so I just had to wait for that new SCART cable to come through the post to complete the modification. While I had the thing open though, I decided to also add a 60Hz switch. This allows you to switch between 50 and 60Hz to play games at the speed that they were originally developed for in Japan. You can find out how to do this mod on the internet of course, and I'll put a link to one of the many pages that describes how to do it in the video comments. It's a pretty simple modification, but it does involve lifting pin 57 of the video chip and connecting a wire to it, which you then run to a switch. Effectively, when pin 57 is connected to the plus 5 volts, you get a 50Hz signal, and when it's connected to ground, you get 60Hz. But actually, if it's not connected to either voltage or ground, it defaults to 50Hz. So what that actually means is you only need two wires, one connected to the pin on the chip and the other connected to ground from the switch. Then when the switch is on, it will ground pin 57 and give you 60Hz, and when it's off, it will default back to 50Hz. So I carefully lifted the pin and attached a wire, and then connected a second wire to the ground on the motherboard, twisted them together for a quick test to make sure it did actually give me 60Hz, and then moved on to connecting a switch to the side of the case. The switch I bought was quite large and I hadn't factored in just how big a hole I was going to need to drill in the side of the case, so big in fact that a normal drill bit wouldn't do the job, and I had to use this drill bit which is typically designed for drilling through wood. It was a little bit of a tense moment as I drilled the case, thinking I might shatter it, but luckily I didn't and ended up with a hole that was perfect for the switch I needed to fit. So I mounted the switch in the side of the case, soldered on the two wires, and that was the 60Hz mod completed. So all that remained was putting everything back in the case, but I also had to cut some pieces out of the RF shield to make room for the modifications I'd made. Once that was done, I sealed the case back up and the RGB mod and 60Hz switch were complete. The final hardware mod I wanted to do is to add an audio socket to my BBC Micro. As standard, the Beeb sound comes from an internal speaker, so what I've been doing for my videos up to now is a fairly primitive solution of putting a microphone right next to where the speaker comes out of and connecting it to a USB sound card. This has worked reasonably well, but it can have the downside of capturing me hitting the keys on the keyboard, which are quite noisy. Now in my case, I'm keeping the speaker as I want to listen to it when I'm playing games. The socket's purely for capturing audio when I'm recording games for my videos. So the first step here was to open up the Beeb and disconnect the keyboard because the sound connector is underneath it. So there's actually a couple of options here. The first is that you could wire the audio connector to the pins used by the speaker. That's connector PL15 and you can see it circled in yellow on this picture. However, while I was reading up on the options for adding an audio connector to the Beeb, I found that you can also connect wires to PL16, which takes the form of two solder pads on the very left hand side of the motherboard as you look at it in this picture. That's circled in red. Once again, I'll add a link in the video comments to the page where I found out about these audio connection alternatives. In the end, I decided connecting the wires to PL16 was the tidiest option, though it may not have been the easiest as it's pretty cramped on the very edge of the motherboard with a lot of other components to negotiate around with the soldering iron. Anyway, I soldered the two wires to PL16 and then connected the other ends to the 3.5mm jack socket that I bought off eBay for a couple of quid. All that remained was to then find a place to mount the socket on the outside of the case, and the obvious place was the Econet port since I'm never actually going to be doing any networking on my BBC Micro. This is pretty easy to drill through since it doesn't actually have any plastic behind it. That does mean it's pretty flimsy, but it should do the job as long as I'm not too rough with it over the years. So I tested that by plugging in some headphones and I could hear the audio coming through it, although it only comes out of one ear on headphones, and I think that's because I bought a mono socket rather than a stereo one, so that was probably a mistake, but it can be rectified by using a mono to stereo converter before plugging in the 3.5mm lead that then goes into the USB sound card. There was another slight issue, which was that you can't just plug the audio output from the Beeb into a microphone socket and expect it to pick it up. That's down to my lack of understanding of the difference between line out and microphone in. Luckily, it just takes a tweak to the settings of the microphone device in Windows to rectify this. So there you go, those are the three hardware improvements that allow me to capture footage from the Atari 2600, Sega Master System 2, and get better sound output from my Beeb. So here's the fruits of my labours. Firstly, some footage from Skyjinx on the Atari 2600. Now, of course, you've never seen footage of the RF connection on Atari 2600, but I can assure you this is miles better. Now for the Master System 2, I took the opportunity to buy a few new games as a friend was selling them. I got this bundle of 5 games for £31 including postage. And here you can see Spider-Man captured from the RGB SCART port. Firstly here's some footage of the 50Hz version. And just to show you the difference, here's what the same game looks like played in 60Hz. And finally a bit of footage captured from the BBC Micro, I decided to use Hypersport simply because via the old method of capturing sound via a microphone, you would have heard me bashing the keys on this, and obviously you can't hear it on this footage. So 
So that's it for this video. I hope you found it helpful to see these modifications and maybe you'll try them out yourself. As I mentioned, you'll find links in the pinned video comments to all the resources I used in performing these modifications. And I hope you found this video interesting. Thanks very much for watching. I'll be back to the normal routine of actually playing games in my next video. So see you then.